Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Amen and amen. I know that's a big prayer, but God says to pray for those in authority over us. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans. And we're going to be looking tonight, and I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. But I want to look tonight, in this brief time that we are together, about a topic and a subject that I have lived, am living, and will live until I go home to be with the Lord. The, the title of this message is called The Mir Miraculous Work of Adversity. And what I want to look at tonight is I want to look at what do we do when we encounter trials and tests and temptations. And not just what do we do, but if we can understand some things about the kingdom of God and how God is working, if that penny can drop, if that revelation can come, I believe that you and I will never be the same because God hasn't just called us to be good little Christians and show up at church and tithe and do the disciplines of faith, but God has actually called us in our generation, wherever we are situated, to actually be changers and to be world changers and to be influencers of our culture and the people in our world. And for me to do that and for me to actually be used of God before I get to go home and be with him in eternity, Right now on planet Earth, God's called me to work the works of God. He's called me to step into the kingdom of God and to step into the realm of the miraculous and to live in the world of the invisible while I am living in this very visible and corporeal world. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. And so if I don't understand how things are working and why things are working the way they are, then I can be, instead of an agent of change and redemption, I can be actually used by the enemy to stumble and to stumble others and to not fulfill and not to bring forth fruit that God's called me to bring forth because God's called each and every one of us to be successful and to bear fruit. That is what blessing means. It means the power to succeed. God spoke over you at the very beginning of creation and he said, have dominion, be fruitful, multiply. Those words have not been recalled by God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. In every one of us, there is a need and a desire to be fruitful. Not just to be creative, but to actually do something and do something with our lives. And maybe you're in a place tonight where you're a little stuck. Or maybe you're in a place tonight where life is a little tough. So tonight I want to look at one of the truths in the Word of God. And I want to look at the adventure of adversity. And if you go with me to the book of Romans in the 12th chapter... I'd like to look at, we're going to read verse 21, but I'd like to go up to verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, speaking of you and I, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. This is where we're going. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, the very essence of good and evil are two opposing forces. And in the School of Theology at the Rock Bible College, I teach Christology, and I did teach the kingdom of God, and I've passed that class on, but it's a great class. And we look at the two opposing forces of good and evil. Jesus defined evil, and he defined good. First of all, when a young man, a young rich ruler came to him and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He stopped him and he said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. So good is a God word. Now there's the goodness of man, but then there is the actual goodness of God. And if God is good, then that would tell me that goodness, God's goodness would be God. Just like God is love. Love is God. Agape. So if God is good, I have defined goodness this way. I have said good then, God's good is God's will, God's way. Because when God told Cain and Abel to bring an offering, and he told them, and we know that he told them because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and Abel brought the right offering and Cain brought an offering out of the dust of the earth. He brought the wrong offering. Now he brought an offering, so he brought what he thought was good. So he did God's will his way. Are you with me? Abel, on the other hand, did God's will God's way. He brought the good offering. 
You see, there is the goodness of God, God's will, God's way. And then there's the goodness of man that eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this world is full of goodness, but it's not God's goodness because it's not God's will, God's way. It may be God's will, man's way. Are you with me? But you see, God is the king. He's God. It's his kingdom. It's his creation. And God doesn't fudge on God's will, my way. God says, my will, my way. He's the king. Therefore, if I'm going to enter into the goodness of God, if I'm going to overcome evil with good, then I'm going to have to do it God's will, God's way. Now, in the theology class, we teach that good is God, and therefore, evil existed after good because we found out that evil was an aberration of goodness. It was actually found in this anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. His name was Lucifer. And iniquity was found in him and he was cast out. And he was the beginning of what is evil. Now, goodness existed before evil, did it not? God created Lucifer, who became Satan, who is the epitome and the beginning of iniquity and evil. Are you following me? Have I lost you? Therefore, if God can exist without evil, then what is greater, evil or goodness? Because God can exist without evil, but evil cannot exist without God. Did you get that? Evil is an aberration of good. It's an absence of God's goodness. It's an absence of God's will, God's way. So evil existed after goodness. God created Lucifer and Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend into the sides of the north. I will have what God has and I will be like him apart from him. And suddenly there was evil. So now we have on this planet and in this universe forces that are diametrically opposed to each other and at war, the forces of good and the force of evil. And therefore, when Jesus came, he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil who is the epitome and the father of all sin and all iniquity and lies, evil. Therefore, there is a war going on between good and evil. Are you with me? Now, that tells me that if there's a war going on, that God just told me in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good, God's will, God's way. So if I'm going to look at this, then I'm going to have to look at the evil that comes at me. The adversity and the negative things and the harsh things and the bad things and the trouble the sickness, the disease, the death, the destruction, everything that is unjust and unfair on this planet, everything that is happening in this secular universe and in this secular world, everything that is not born of the Spirit of God, God's will, God's way, that is God's good, that is coming at me and wants to steal and kill and destroy me and overcome me. But God says, I don't want you to be overcome with evil. I want you to understand that you are my children on this planet. You are now new creations. You are no longer what you used to be. You are now absolute, positive, wall-to-wall, -wall, Holy Spirit, filled with the divine nature of God. All the promises of God have been given unto me. They are yes and amen in Christ Jesus because he has gone to the cross. He's purchased redemption and he's purchased what God has for me, the resource of the kingdom of God. And it's been given to me, but now I've got to learn how to use it and overcome the evil that is coming at me with it. The goodness of God, which is God's will, God's way. So having said that, I'm going to look at this mystery of adversity. Because if we can understand some of these things tonight, when trouble comes at you, when injustice comes at you, when things that aren't fair and aren't right are coming at your life, you will understand some things and you will know how to overcome and rule over them, not in the flesh, not in the old nature, 
not in the finite resources of mankind, but in the infinite resources of the new creation in Christ Jesus. Because he's the head, we're the body. He is not separated from me. He's not in heaven and I'm down on the earth and I'm here all by myself. He actually is in me. He's wrapped himself in flesh. He's wrapped himself in my flesh. He's wrapped himself in your flesh. He is not separated from us. And he wants us to move and to live and to overcome on this planet in the kingdom of God and rule over darkness and evil. But there's a way to do it. So let's look at some things. Number one, and I'm going to just give you just two keys tonight and then some things to think about. Is that all right? Key number one. Our evils are never the encounter in themselves. But the effect we allow them to have on us, no matter whether an experience is apparently good or evil, to the one who fears and doubts, all is evil. To the one who trusts in faith, all is good. So what is God saying in this key? He is saying that all things work themselves to good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That no matter what's coming at me, if I'm operating in faith, if I'm operating in trust, if I'm operating in the kingdom of God, even the evil that comes at me is actually going to turn around for good. That means that nothing that comes against me, nothing that comes against me, theoretically is bad. Because all of it has a redemptive possibility in the kingdom of God. And all of it has at its core God's desire to train us in overcoming victory through this trial and this test and this injustice. But if we launch out at it in the arm of the flesh, maybe in the goodness of God, God's will, my way, you see, I'm not going to win. This has to be fought in the realm of the spirit because the invisible enemy that's coming against us fights us in the spirit. And if he can keep me in the flesh, if he can keep me in the meager resources of my own abilities, my age, my strength, my talent, my thought process, all that makes me me, I am no match for him. But if I step into the realm of the supernatural, if I begin to step into the realm of faith, if I begin to walk into the spirit, and if I begin to step into Jesus, and if I am in him and he's in me, then I am fighting the battle through my God and my king who has already overcome. And I am forcing the victory that Jesus Christ gave me at Calvary and the resurrection. All right? So I'm going to just read this key one more time because I know some of you didn't get it. Key number one, our evils, the trials, the tests, the shortcomings, the injustice that comes against us are never the encounter in themselves. In other words, they're just not coming at us for no reason. There's a reason behind them. But the effect we allow them to have on us depends on how we are going to experience them. We are either going to experience them in faith and in trust and overcome or in fear and unbelief and we'll lose. So it's how we respond and we fight back to the injustice and the evil and the adversity that comes at us that I want to talk about tonight. Now we see this very clearly. This very clearly is demonstrated to us in the cross of Jesus Christ. God is a show and tell God. He wrapped himself in flesh. God put himself in flesh. He limited himself to flesh. God had never been in flesh before. He was God. He is God. He commanded all things. The one that created all things, the one that made all things, the one that spoke the world into existence, Jesus, the word of God, the Logos, wrapped himself in finite flesh, and he walked this earth as a fusion of all God and all man, and he limited himself to his word and to the human experience with the supernatural spirit of God so that he could show us how he wrapped himself and how he lived so that when he was raised from the dead and he gave the spirit to us, we would understand how we're to walk and how we're to fight, just like he did. So if you want to know what you're supposed to look like and how you're supposed to be, just check out Jesus in the flesh. And it's the Lord of the carpenter shop. It's the Lord of the roads. It's the Lord of the masses. It's the Lord that was inconvenienced. 
It's the Lord that never had a moment of privacy. It's the Lord that faced the surly oppositions. It's the Lord that faced every human experience and overcame in every way, every time that I am to watch and to see and I'm to walk like. Because as he overcame in this world, so am I. So the first and the greatest example that I want to look at tonight is Calvary. Because the worst thing that could ever happen to him, which was the crucifixion and the cross and the agent of death became the absolute agent of resurrection and life and victory. So God is saying, as you look at the crucifixion and adversity is coming at you, understand that there are principles here that I want you to see. That when adversity comes at you and it looks like you're going to fail and it looks like you're going to die and it looks like you're going under, consider Jesus who learned obedience through the things that he suffered and the cross and the death and understand that with every death there is a supernatural resurrection of life and power that we would not be overcome with evil but we would overcome evil with the goodness of God and the kingdom of heaven. But it takes some knowing. So let's look at some things. When he said, not my will but yours be done to God at Gethsemane, he was showing me and showing you how to overcome the worst trial that you'll ever go through. He was showing that I have got to give up my life and take on God's will. Because when I give up my life and my will for God's will, that is the first step into victory in God. It may look like you're going down in defeat, but God knows something that we don't know. And he knows that even though there's a cross and a death, there is Sunday coming, there's a resurrection coming, there is life coming, and he has a plan and a purpose for this. And he's not sending us this evil to see if we're going to be good little Christians and we're going to be faithful to him. There's a far greater purpose involved in the evil coming at us than that. And that's the lie of the enemy, but I'm getting ahead of myself. When Jesus was going to the cross, he predominated his thoughts with not the enemy and what was going to happen to him, but with his victory. In John 14, 30, this is what he says about the, the enemy. He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He is nothing to me. He may be coming, and I may be looking like I'm about to face the greatest trial and defeat of my life, but the ruler of this world that's trying to overcome me has nothing in me. I have given him no place. I have given him no foothold. He has nothing in me. He may come at me and he may destroy this flesh. Oh, but the inner man, the one that's eternal, that one he cannot destroy. And you see, it may look like you're being destroyed, but there is something far greater working in you than you can imagine. He had his mind on fullness of joy. In John 16, verses 20 through 24, he said, most of these, are, this is before he goes to the cross. This is his, his last moments with his disciples. He says, assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, speaking of when he's going to the cross. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. He's about to go to the cross. He knows what's going to happen. He knows where he has to go. He knows that there has to be a death. He knows that he had to learn obedience to the things that he suffered. He had to go to that cross so that you and I could be saved. But he knows that in that death, there is a resurrection coming. And in that resurrection, there is a power that the world and the universe has never seen. And he'll have the keys of death and hell in his hand. He will be seated at the right hand of the Father and every Everything will be given back to us because he is conquered. Now, if he knows that, if he knows that on the way to the cross, that tells me that when trouble's coming at me, when injustice is coming at me, when sickness is coming at me, listen, I just had a terrible doctor's report in the natural. The doctor says my eyes are not living as long as my body wants to live and that I could go blind. Well, I could look at that and I could be scared and I could be afraid. Or 
I can look at this and say, oh, hell no. Now, I'm not trying to be a little smart aleck, but hell wants to come at me. And I could cave into the fear, and I could cave into self-pity, and I could cave into the flesh, or I can step into the spirit and be what I'm supposed to be, which is a daughter of God. Face the worst that I can face in faith and not in fear. Just like he faced the cross with joy, with faith, with resurrection knowledge, knowing exactly what was going to happen. He faced with cheerfulness and trouble. John 16, 33. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. What is he saying? Oh, don't worry. Be of good cheer. In other words, rejoice. Have you ever wondered why the apostles, they said, rejoice when you encounter trials and tests of your faith? Rejoice in your tribulations. Could it be that they knew something we don't know? Could it be that they were operating in a position and a fact of the kingdom of heaven that you and I really don't get? The penny hasn't dropped about trials and tests yet. Because you see, Jesus went to the cross and he said, yeah, you're going to have trouble in the world, but be of good cheer. Rejoice. Why? Because I'm going to the cross, but there's a resurrection coming. And I've swallowed up death and hell and everything that's going to come against you. Everything that sin has brought to this planet. Everything that evil has succumbed to now is going to be swallowed up in the victory of life. Because in death, in absolute death, there will be absolute God life. And you cannot destroy the God life. You can't destroy it. It cannot be killed. It is not dead. It's alive and well. And the power of that life is in you and I. So let's move on. So we found out that it's not the evil coming at us. It's how we handle the evil. Number two, here's another key. Adversity is the doorway into God's most ultimate secret. Trials and suffering, which in their origin are the effects of sin, and used by Satan to destroy, in the grip of faith, become redemptive. Recover, restore, transform, and recreate the situation. You're looking at me like cows looking at a new gate. Adversity is the doorway into God's most ultimate secret. Trials and suffering, which in their origin, are satanic and brought on by sin and its destruction. There's no doubt about it. And they're used by Satan to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But in the power of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, in the grip of faith, in the heart of a believer who is walking by faith and walking in the power of the Spirit, these very trials actually become redemptive. What does that mean, redemptive? To redeem something means to buy it back and restore it and recover everything. So if God wants me to be redemptive, first he has bought me back and recovered me and restored me. Now my life here on this planet is to be redemptive. I am to help others recover. I am to restore others. I am to bring the kingdom of God into my world. How does that happen? You see, it doesn't happen because I'm in self-pity and fear and unbelief, and I'm just a little nominal Christian coming to church and maybe believe in God sometimes, but not believe in God other times. You see, it happens when a man and a woman will stop their life and say, I can't go on like this. It's either all God or no God. It's either his will or no will. It's either all true or none of it's true. He either went to that cross, raised from the dead, and everything in that book is right and is agreeable and is yes and amen to Jesus Christ because he's bought it with his blood. And if it's true, then I better start believing it and I better start living it. And when I begin to do that, I now become a dangerous believer and a believer that when evil, injustice, sickness, disease, sin, everything that wants to come at me and stop me, it's actually going to come at me, but I'm not going to be overcome with the evil. I'm going to overcome that evil with good. God's will, God's way, and it becomes redemptive. I now recover. I now restore. I now bring back, and I now have some of the answers to some of the problems of the people around me. And instead of me being so needy and always needing, 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 now I become a vessel that God flows to and through with the kingdom of God and the power of God and the love of God and the generosity of God. You see, now we are a church operating in the power of the Spirit. Now we're changing our world. 
Now we're changing the things around us. Now we're shaking our city. Now we're making a difference in our families. Now when the enemy wants to come in and destroy a marriage and destroy you and your children with sickness and disease and get you to bail on each other and bail on your churches, now we stop and we say, oh no, oh no. I'm not going to put up with this report. It may be coming at me, but I'm going after it. And I'm going to overcome evil with the goodness of God. It's a different reality. It's a different perspective. It's living life in a different plane completely. It's not earth bound. It is heaven bound. And there is a great difference, church. And the early church and the fathers of the church understood this principle. Adversity dealt with from God's perspective is transformed from something to be endured as an opposition to Satan to something used to conquer Satan and his victims. Let me say it again. Adversity dealt with from this perspective, it's a God perspective, is a transformation from the mindset that this adversity that's coming at me is something to be endured and it's coming from Satan. You see, that's one perspective. I was taught that sickness and disease and these things that come at me, well, it's God's will. He's going to teach you something. He wants to teach, to teach you to be humble. He wants to see how faithful you're going to be to him. I was, I was taught all of those things. So then I thought, well, gosh, if, if God's teaching me something and he's making me sick, then I shouldn't ask him to heal me. Hello? That if God's doing it and sending it, then why do we pray for the sick? Shouldn't we just all be sick and happy about it? Gee, if poverty's coming at me, shouldn't I just accept it? Or why do I want to strive to be successful so that I can give and bless others? You see, we can be failures on purpose, or we can be successes for purpose. I choose to be a success for the purposes of God. But I've got to understand this thing about adversity because if I give into it, if I cave into it, then I'm going to be a Christian that says this thing is to be endured. And God's not testing me. He doesn't send evil to me, but God has seen what I'm going to do with it. Instead of the difference of saying this adversity that's coming at me is to be overcome with good so that I can actually become a redemptive participant in the kingdom of God and rescue and restore and redeem and repurpose all of this evil that's coming at me and I can help other people with it. Do you understand the difference? Am I making any sense? Now what are you going to say? No? As if I'm going to stop? God wants me to see evil coming at me as a training ground to conquer it and to redeem its victims. He doesn't want me to see the evil coming at me as something I have to endure and that he's going to test me and see how faithful I'm going to be to him. That's infantile. He wants us to grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. He's not here to see if you're going to be good little Christians. He already knows what you're going to do. He knows the end from the beginning. What he is doing is leaving us on this planet with all the tools at our disposal of the kingdom of heaven, with the faith of the Son of God, with the Holy Spirit, so that when evil comes at us, we learn how to operate as citizens of the kingdom of God and overcome this evil with good, not afraid and not fearful, but full of faith and going after the evil and destroying it and bringing the kingdom into our world. It's a vast difference. Destroying one of the greatest lies of the enemy is this, that God sends trials to satisfy himself to our faithfulness instead of God allows these trials to come to teach us to overcome an overcoming faith and learn how to be people that redeem and reconcile and restore and give back what Satan has stolen. So the point Satan and evil circumstances in our lives are God's most useful instruments for the fulfillment of his purposes. Satan and evil circumstances in our lives are God's most useful instruments 
for the fulfillment of his purposes. What the enemy meant for evil, God means for good. And this is a setup, and it's a training ground so that you learn how to kick some butt and get strong and become demon caster outers. Become people of God that are not afraid and wimpy and self-centered and selfish and have to live for our own comforts and our own wills. But we actually become redemptive like the first century church and we're willing to lay our lives down for the will of the king and do what it takes to see the kingdom of God come into our world. When that begins to happen, this church will shake with the power of God. Satan and evil circumstances in our lives are God's most useful instruments for the fulfillment of his purposes. Let me give you an example. I got to quick. I got to go quick. Are you all right with me? This is concepts tonight. Let me tell you a story. Over 100 years ago, a tornado struck the prairies of Minnesota. Many were killed. Hundreds were injured. And one small town was almost demolished. In the midst of the disaster, an elderly British surgeon and his two medically trained sons worked out almost around the clock for days, abiding and aiding the stricken, the bandaging the wounds, and setting broken limbs. This was 100 years ago. This heroic work did not go unnoticed. Their excellence as physicians and their selflessness in the service of those in need created a following among the tornado victims. The doctor and his sons were offered financial backing to build a hospital, provided that they would take charge. The men agreed and in 1889 founded a clinic that soon attracted nationwide attention and their little clinic grew. The city was Rochester, Minnesota. The elderly doctor's name was William W. Mayo, his son William J. and Charles Mayo. The clinic is simply called the Mayo Clinic. It now consists of over 500 physicians treating more than 200,000 people a year. It is known worldwide as one of the premier places of health, healing, and excellence in medicine. I'm sure if you ask the citizens of Minnesota about the Rochester tornado at that time, they would have said it was all about death and destruction, an unqualified disaster. But in the perspective of better than 100 years later, and in the hands of a creative God, that tornado was really about life, help, and healing. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, For God causes all things to work together for good, God's will, God's way, to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Let me read you one more little thought here before I go into the four things and then we'll close with this. Tonight, if you don't get anything out of this, just remember this, that trials, tests, injustice, and suffering, when it comes at us, it looks like it's there to take us out, but it's actually there to, to cause us to become overcomers in the victory of Jesus Christ. And the cross is the demonstration of the death that looked like failure, but the resurrection was coming that was going to absolutely swallow up death and bring salvation to the universe. Alexander Solzhenitsyn is a famous believer and a famous Christian in what we know today as Russia. He was in the gulag, he was in a prisoner, a prison camp in Siberia, and he's a famous author and a famous believer, and this is what he wrote. He said, we're too comfortable to be spiritual. We think we'll be able to pursue God better without danger of hardship. We think we'll be able to pursue God better without danger or hardship. We think we'll be able to pursue God better without danger or hardship. We think we will be able to pursue God better without danger or hardship. You see, the natural man wants to recoil from suffering, recoil from hardship, recoil from danger. Our natural intent is to be comfortable and to have a good life. But you see, this is what Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote. And yet it works in just the opposite way. Nothing is more difficult than to grow spiritually when comfortable. That's why the believer Alexander Solzhenitsyn's reaction to his exile to the Soviet labor camp was to bless it. Because it was there that he discovered that, and I quote him, 
the meaning of earthly existence lies not, as we have grown used to thinking, in prospering, but in the development of the soul. God allows suffering, not so that you and I can be miserable, but so that we can learn overcoming faith and overcome evil with good. So if we can let that penny drop, when things come to us, when bad things happen, when bad diagnosis, when bad circumstances, when this one does this or that one does this and injustice hits us and it will happen. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble and tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yes, there was a death at the cross, but don't look at the death. Look at the resurrection life and the new birth that brought forth the salvation of the world. Yes, it may look bad right now, but don't stay there. There is life at the end of this trial. There is life at the end of that injustice. There is God's power as the evil comes at you and I. If we will do these four little things, and I'm going to end with these, and I'm going to go fast. So what do we do? This is just a thought tonight. There's so much to say to this. But let me just give you four little things that Jesus showed me in his life that he did when evil came at him and he overcame it. You ready? Number one, I've got to look at this evil from a new reality, just like he did. Satan may be coming, but he has nothing in me. Rejoice when you encounter trials and tests. In other words, rejoice. Don't look at the evil. Look at what God's going to do through that evil coming at us when we overcome it. Colossians 1.24. This is what Paul writes about it. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. You see, he understood that his sufferings, when he wrote to the church at Colossae and he was in prison in Rome, he understood that even though he was in prison and even though his bonds were there, there was something greater working than what it looked like. Even though it looked like he was failing and he was in prison, he understood this principle of life and goodness overcoming evil. Because this is what he said to the Philippian church. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, he said, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. We follow in his steps not to gain our salvation, that's the free gift, but by transforming our trials into victories by faith. When we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and bring faith and victory to a lost and dying world. So it's a change of perspective. It's a setup. You're not going under, you're going over. Number two, pray. And pray with friends. Because that's what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He gathered Peter, James, and John. He said, stay there, pray with me. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to pray a while. And you know it very well. And we'll just look at Matthew chapter 26. and verse 36, Jesus came and with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He was honest with his friends. He was honest. Here's God being honest with his friends. God is exceedingly sorrowful, wrapped in flesh, and he's telling his friends, God did not make us to do this alone. When things are coming at you, you need to gather your friends. You need to find people of faith, and you need to pray with them, and you need to stay with them, and you need to get to the house of God because God has not called you to be a lone survivor and to do this by yourself. Find some friends that will believe with you and pray with them. He says, he went a little farther. He fell on his face, and he prayed, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Now, look, this is what I want to say about praying. Not only pray with friends that will believe with you, but be honest with God. Sometimes I think we think we got to do these most holy religious prayers, you know, and just talk to God with faith. Like, you know, here's, here's what I'm supposed to say to you instead of just really telling God what you're feeling. Talk to him. He is your father. He knows what's coming at you and he can see it far better than you can. And you may be confused about it. You may be, you know, when I found this out about my eyes, I didn't know what to say. I just said, God, I don't want to grow old and be blind. I don't want to be an old woman and blind in my parents and my family. I'm dependent on my family to lead me around. I was honest with God. You see, God knows you. He made you. He loves you. He knows what you're facing. He sees the dragon that you don't see. But he's made you to overcome.
He's made you to be a creature, a creation in his image of faith and power. And I think it grieves his heart when we step back in fear and unbelief. But when we step out in faith and courage, and not our courage, but his courage. And that's not going to happen without prayer. Because you're not made to do this alone. And you cannot do this by yourself. You must have the power of God. And you need a community of believers that love you and believe in you. So... Look at evil from a new reality. Pray, an honest prayer. Number three, add up the facts. Add up the facts. What does that mean? 2 Corinthians 4. This is Paul writing. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. He's talking about crucifixion and resurrection, life and death. Look what he said. Pressed on every side, but not crushed. Forsaken, but not struck down, not destroyed. For we who live are always delivered. Let's go down. He says in verse, so then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith, according to it, it is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We believe and therefore we speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Listen, trouble is going to come. It's how we greet it and how we deal with it that determines whether we will overcome or we will succumb to the trouble. And God says, children, know who you are. Know the one that lives in you. Know the one that conquered death and hell. Know the one that paid the price so that everything you need is yours. You have but to ask. So God says, number one, live from a new reality. Number two, pray and be honest with me. Gather your friends and believe together. Add up the facts. Count it all joy. That's why they said we can rejoice in this. They weren't masochistic and crazy and sadistic. They understood that there was a principle working here that was far greater than anything the natural man could see. It's a setup to train you in overcoming and became in believers that are so redemptive that when you walk into a room that you're not afraid, the devils that are there are afraid. And they say, oh no, here they come. Yeah, you're going to be persecuted. Yeah, there's things coming at you, but guess what? That's exactly how life is supposed to be so that you can overcome. And the last one, and I'll quit with this. Stay put. Don't move from that place of pressure. Romans 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, endurance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and character and hope will never disappoint because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. Listen. God says, stay in your spot. The temptation will be to bail. I'm going to bail on the marriage. I'm going to bail on this. I'm going to quit the job. I'm going to move. I'm going to do this. I'm leaving the church. I'm leaving that relationship. Why? Because pressure, pressure. But the only difference between a lump of coal and a diamond is pressure. One could take it and one couldn't. And if you'll stay in that place of pressure, if you won't bail and you won't leave, God can turn that situation around and you will not be overcome with evil. Miss destiny, but you will overcome evil with good. So beloved, what is God saying to us tonight? He's saying there's a mystery of adversity working in you. It's not the evil that's coming at you. It's how you handle the evil. And I'm training you to overcome that evil with good and be redemptive overcomers, citizens of my kingdom, bringing the kingdom of God into your generation and making a difference until we get to go home. So having said that, look at evil from a new reality. Pray honest prayers with friends that love you. Add up the facts. And stay put, because God's got this if you'll just follow his steps. <laughs> Amen. That's going to be quite a night. Reinhardt was here about 12 years ago in the other building. This church raised $50,000, I think, 
And we gave it to Reinhardt. 50,000? I was back in 1998. It's where we borrowed from him. He says, Africa will be saved. <laughs> That's when we borrowed the Inland Empire shall be saved. He deposited that in us. We were a much younger church then. This is so real. God is so God, and Jesus Christ is his only begotten son. There is no other way to salvation. There is no other way to God. There are not many roads that lead to heaven. There's only one. God paid the highest price that heaven could pay to make sure that that road was secured for you and I. You know, we live in a nation that says, ah, if you're a good person, you're going to heaven. God never said we're going to be heaven bound if we're good because we discussed good tonight. The goodness of man and the goodness of God are vastly different. Before I leave tonight, I need to talk to you very seriously about a truth that is eternal. And that is that you were made for eternity. You were not made for hell. But when you die, and you will die, so will I. The definition of death is simply separation. You will separate from this earthly tent that you're living in. Eternity is in your heart, put there by God, because you were made in the image of God. And your spirit is eternal. And there's coming a day, and you don't know when that day is, when you will separate from this earthly tent. And where will you spend eternity? Will you spend eternity in heaven with your father? Or will you spend eternity in hell with Satan and his demons? God did not make you for hell. He did not make you to be separated from him. He made you to be with him. But there's only one way to him, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. You must be born again. Beloved, you're here tonight, and you're not here by chance. You're here by divine design. And if you have never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never allowed him to be your savior and your Lord, Lord means boss, then God forbid if you were to walk out those doors tonight and through no fault of your own, death was to claim you. You would not spend eternity in heaven. You would find yourself in hell. And God never made you for that. Nor did he pay such a high price for you that you would choose to go there. But it's your choice. Because God's done everything he can do on his side. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, I'm a whosoever, you're a whosoever, would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And God says, I've given you everything I can give you, but now it's your choice and it's your decision. He's a gentleman. He will not impose his salvation upon you. It is a gift and gifts must be received. They can be given, but you can't, you can't expect to have them unless you take them and open them and receive them. So tonight, my question to you is, where are you going to spend eternity? What makes you think that you belong in God's heaven? And have you surrendered all of your heart and all, all of your life to Jesus Christ? Because it is his heaven, and we get there his way. You must be born again. I already said born again is a surrendering of your heart and your life. Saying to Jesus Christ, I believe that you are who you said you are. That you are the only begotten son of God. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. And I believe that you are the savior of the world. Will you take me? I give you my life. See, that's surrendering your life to him. It's not just coming to church. It's not just having religious thoughts. It's not putting in religious time. It's actually forging a relationship with your God by saying yes to him, accepting what he's done, receiving it in your life, and giving him yours. It's called surrender. Beloved, if you've never done that, tonight I want to invite you. In this small auditorium, in this small crowd tonight, if you've never surrendered all of your heart, and all of your life to Jesus Christ. Asking him and letting him be Savior and Lord. Then tonight you are here by divine design to ask him and let him become Lord and Savior of your life. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. 
If you've never surrendered your life to him, I'm talking to you. If you've been a, a good a good person, but you've never given him your heart and your life, I'm so talking to you. And if you've been a rascal, I am so talking to you. You're looking at an older woman who was once a rascal. Had no reason for God to save me, but because he just loved me and saved me, he did. He's not in shock over your sin, over what you're doing, how you're living. He's simply here, inviting you. One who he loved so much he couldn't live without to receive what he's given you, which is salvation. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a minute. I'm going to ask, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to hit this pulpit and say, raise your hand, we'll do it together. Why? Because you don't get saved by assenting to God. You get saved by surrendering your heart and your life to him. So we're going to pray with you tonight. You say, well, I'm going to be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Everybody's going to see, yeah, because we're going to have our heads up and our eyes open. But, you know, we figure it like this at The Rock. It's called radical Christianity. You know what that means? It means if you can't say yes to Jesus in a safe place that's prayed you in and loves you here, how are you going to walk out those doors into a hostile world of unbelief? Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. But if you confess me, I'll confess you. It's a, it's a relationship of mutual surrender and love. He loved you, now will you love him back? You may not know him but he's asking for your life. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you. If you need to get right with God tonight, I'm talking to you. I'm going to count to three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see if you need to get right with God. Just raise your hand. Let me see it. Raise it high. I see that hand. I see that hand. I, I need to put my glasses on. I see that hand. There's more. There's at least five more hands. There, there's a hand. I see it. Anybody else? This is what we're going to do. Sorry. I don't know why people wouldn't want this amazing God that made us created everything you see, what you think you climbed out from the ooze and the slime. You think this just happened? You think you just are who you are just and you just evolved into this being? Or is there a creator that made you? Loves every cell in your body and created your spirit to be with him. Why would you not want to spend eternity with him? What we're going to do is there were hands that went up we're going to stand because we're ready to dismiss. And as we stand, and if you raised your hand or you didn't, and you need to get right with God tonight, or you need him, and you want him, I want you to slip out of your seats and just join me right here, and let's get right with God. As we sing this song, if you raise your hand, don't be embarrassed, don't be shy. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by inviting Jesus into your heart. Come and meet me here. Let's get right with God. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Just come home. Just come quickly. But let's come. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I the yearnings of heaven for you. I'm just a little old lady and I don't know you and you don't know me but the God in heaven that made you he loves you more than you can imagine. There's some of you in here that are just struggling right now and you're thinking should I have come to yes and I'm going to let him sing this one more time because God is stopping this service because he wants to tell you, come home. 
We're going to sing this just one more time. He's saying, just get out of your seat and stop all of this nonsense and come home. We're going to sing it one more time. Please. And I surrender all. look at me and smile you're not going to a funeral you're going to a birthday party and it's yours the angels are actually celebrating because you're coming home they love you and they're not mad at you so you don't get prayed by raising your hand you get prayed by asking Jesus into your heart so this is Pastor Joel and we're gonna just slip away into a little private room and we're gonna pray with you and tell you some things about what's happened to you okay so if you will just turn this way which would be right Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent Him for me, and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.